Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Broker Breakdown with myself and James. And this week, we wanted to uh, bring some insight into what a very popular time of the year is, boating season at cottages, around your around your properties, you know, wherever wherever you vacation or even just, you know, maybe at your primary home there, wherever it might be. It's uh, It's a beautiful time of the year here. In Southern Ontario, we get these couple of beautiful months for boating, and I know a lot of people love being out on the water or even just out at their docks, for example, or um, even harbor, James. I know lots of people do kind of uh, harbor visits with neighbors and whatnot, so we figured an episode on boats would be appropriate this time of the year and and give some insight into those that uh, have their own boats as well. Yeah, boating season is... In full force already, the great weather we've had so far, even into like May, um, going into later parts of June here, it's been a boater's paradise. Realistically, they've I I saw boats even out like end of April, right? Maybe not the greatest weather, but like even for fishing and stuff, because uh, I'm big into fishing and I I we used to have fishing boats when I was a little bit younger, but yeah, it's yeah. just we want to bring up some important not only insurance topics, but maybe just some safety topics and general topics in general when it comes to boating and a few other watercraft. I know um, jet skis have become super popular and they've always been really popular, but um, just kind of some generalized topics, not only from the insurance side, but just from boating safety in general that we wanted to kind of bring up, especially with the summer kind of, I guess, realistically kicking off for most people now because schools are going to be out soon. I don't know when schools actually end anymore. It's always different now, but I know when I was younger, schools ended right around this time, Mike. So even as parents, realistically summer starts like now (laughs) where for us and like working people, I guess you could say it was like at the end of May into June. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and I think actually today's the first day of summer. Technically, if I got that right is what, uh, what they say. Is it interesting? Like, unless so I'm perfect, wrong, I, perfect I, time to do this episode. Then <laughs> I know, I know. I'm pretty sure today is technically the kickoff to summer. Um, I'm not going to Google it, but I, I was pretty sure I heard that on the radio yesterday. Interesting. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's going to be. It's good. We'll have lots of insight that way. I mean, boats are super, super fun. If, if obviously, a lot of people out there have had them. Um, bring them up to again, like your vacation property, wherever you might have, and you know, have it with family and friends. But there are certain things you need to know. Not only safety wise, but insurance wise, um, because uh, unfortunately, like all wreck vehicles, accidents can and will happen, and there are certain things you should know about your own policy as well, or or things you should maybe ask moving forward. Yeah, I think just kicking it off, we'll obviously start with the actual insurance side of things. And again, me and Mike, we did talk about this before, but we actually kind of went through some of this stuff and like a lot of it is very similar to like what your auto policy would look like. So we see that on boats, you obviously have liability, like basically anything else. Um, you have physical damage and theft and fire and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, the biggest difference though, is obviously you're going to have, have trailers and contents, which is interesting, Mike, um, because trailers, obviously, unless you're realistically having your boat, like at a property where it's in, and you can take it out by like a lift or something. Most people will obviously have trailers because they like to transport their boat maybe from one area, one bay, one body of water to another body of water. So that will obviously be need to be covered under your boat insurance. But also contents. Um, a lot of people obviously bring contents onto the boat. Obviously, life jackets are a main staple of boating, which we'll get to later on in um, the safety side of things. Um, but other contents, like if you fish, you want to obviously have con or you want to have coverage for your fishing rods and tackle and stuff when it's on the boat. Um, any kind of personal items that you might keep on boats. Like I know people keep like speakers and coolers and that kind of stuff. So there are areas of a boating policy that will obviously cover for these areas. And it's very, very important to obviously make sure that you're covering it right. Because at the end of the day, if there is going to be a claim, you want to make sure that these things are paid out. You don't want to spend. And again, as a fisherman myself, the amount of money you can spend on fishing rods and tackle and lures and equipment and stuff. And then to have all that 
destroyed and not replaced by insurance because you didn't put the right amount of coverage on it is obviously going to be a huge hit, not only to yourself, but to your pocketbook because then you have to go replace it out of your own pocket. So, yeah. And you know what? The big thing about, um, I mean, the big thing about boats is uh, there's two, I mean, there's two main aspects. Obviously the biggest thing that I guess the average consumer thinks about is what is the boat worth, right? So the agreed upon value, James, for the insurance. So what, what I get if it is stolen, for example, or damage where it's not repairable. Um, and I guess the only thing I'll really say first, and I'll let you jump in after, is that you can get boat policies on replacement cost basis, but you can also get them on kind of like that broad form or uh, what we call ACV basis, so the actual cash value. Um, the really the only thing to really note is that replacement cost is going to give you a better, kind of more broader claim settlement experience because the amount that you're insuring it for should be you know what you get with respect to a claims check and how the process is whereas if you're insuring an older boat uh, the insurance company takes in depreciation on the actual cash value basis so typically you'll see those policies are a little bit cheaper just because the level of coverage is is less as well exactly and it's very like i said like any insurance policy, it's always very important to obviously review it, make sure it's covered properly. Because again, we did see during the pandemic where like basically everything else, boats skyrocketed in value. So you had these little tin boats or aluminum boats, 14, 12, 16 feet that were going for like a thousand dollars. Well, during the pandemic, and even now, these boats now are like two, three, four, five, six thousand dollars. So you want to make sure from a coverage standpoint that, again, if you're seeing that your boat um, is increasing in value like that, you want to make sure that you're covering it properly. Because five years ago, that boat, if it was worth a thousand bucks and now it's worth three thousand bucks, well, that's obviously going to change, should be changed on your insurance to make sure that if there is a claim that you want to make sure that you get the right settlement out of that instead of getting what it was worth maybe five years ago. So definitely a big, right. big part of your policy you should be reviewing. Now, again, we're in a very weird time where these assets that might have never increased in value, but were always decreasing in value. So you might never have to deal with that. But like I said, in the world that we live in today with how short everything is realistically in, in supply, we are seeing that even cars are still increasing in value. You can drive a car for two or three years and basically still make what you paid at, paid for it three years at before. Boats are, I would almost say recreational vehicles are worse because they're not obviously making as much recreational vehicles. So you can basically ride these boats for three, five years and basically sell it for what you paid for three, five years ago. So it's yes, very, very important right. that you are making sure that the amount that you're like insuring it for is always accurate because I find that these amounts are fluctuating even more in today's world. Yeah, well, and there's, there's a bit of that too, which is just kind of consumer market research because you can go on places like Boat Trader and other places that have kind of boat values and kind of see what maybe a similar make model in year would would um, would run you if you were to buy it. Um, but there's not really like a black book value. And we as brokers don't have any way of really determining what that value is. So unless you physically have a new boat that you have the bill of sale for and you want to insure it for that you know brand new amount, which is fair, if you have a used boat that's maybe 10 or 15 years old, you really the only way to find out is kind of to, to see what the current market is based on you know a similar boat, if not the same one out there in the marketplace. So you're right, James. And a lot of people might ask that, well, how do I know what the right value is, Mike? And the answer is, we don't know either. It's just, what would you feel comfortable with insuring on it? Um, and keeping in mind, obviously, the more expensive or the more coverage you have on the boat, obviously, the more price you're going to pay for the insurance. And um, it's not really like a stagnant number, James. It's kind of just as the boat value goes up, obviously, you're going to pay more, but it's not like in increments, right? It's not like you can say, oh, every $1,000 is $100, for example. It, it doesn't work like that. But uh, I would say what you what you feel comfortable with insuring a boat for is very insured base, right? You really have to kind of have at least an idea about what you'd want to see if there was a loss and then just be okay with paying whatever that price is for it. 
So there's two points I want to make kind of before we move on, which is um, basically motor related. But motors and some insurance companies do this is they'll actually a rating factor on your boat insurance not only comes from the, obviously the, the value of your boat, but also comes from the size of your motor. So someone that drives a 25 horsepower compared to a 50 horsepower, usually the 50 horsepower is going to cost more to insure because it's a higher horsepower motor. On the flip side of that, outboard motors are usually covered under the content side because they are able to unattach and attach back on, especially trolling motors are actually covered under your content side because they're not technically a part of the boat. Either you've attached it or it's come as like a separate option on a boat. Um, So again, make sure if you are in an outboard motor style boat that you're making sure you're asking your broker and how that company is basically rating for the motor and whatnot, because most times they are actually insured under the content side, because like I said, they are detachable from the boat. Now an inboard don't really have to have that issue because those are questions that are asked at that time. But again, an outboard motor, I can basically take whatever motor I want off that boat and put whatever motor I want back on it. So I can take a 25 and put a 50. I can put a 75 if I really wanted to. So, and again, obviously the higher horsepower you have usually is going to cost more as a motor. So it's also going to going to cost more on the insurance side of things to actually insure. Yeah, I know. I know if, uh, in the past, on like home policies, if you insure it on like a home policy as a boat, instead of having a separate policy, which a lot of people uh, used to do quite frequently as well, they would actually ask for individual values between what the boat, motor, and trailer is. So let's say you have a boat that's five grand. Let's say your motor's five because motors can um, can definitely add up. I've seen that quite a bit in the past. And then with the trailer's a thousand bucks. They wanted the individual breakdowns for that because as you insure it on the home under the boat floater, as it was called, it would ensure all three of those things with uh, specific values, but it was under that together. So I think there's been some changes over the years a little bit, but um, to my knowledge, James, some of the companies still look at it that way. Like all three of them are part of the boat. So it depends on, I guess, which company you're yeah, which it, company you're looking at. Again, just like how auto and home insurance depend on each company, so is boat insurance. Not every company is going to offer boat insurance. There's honestly very little companies that actually offer it. Um, so it's always important to make sure like how that company is breaking down every coverage when you are trying to insure your boat because every company is going to be different. So it's very, very vital that if you are quoting with multiple companies, make sure you're asking those questions. Well, how is this covered? How is this going to be covered with this company or company A or B or C to make sure that it's being covered properly? Yeah, I mean that's that, and that's the biggest thing. Again, finding that person you trust. Um, I mean, you can go online and, and check any place for random boat quotes. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be accurate. So, I think that's my biggest plug every episode is making sure at least you have it with someone that you feel confident confident with. Yeah, and they can give you the right information, and at least, like I said, they can compare and and show you what the differences might be. Because again, we have gone in a different route where, like you said, Mike. A lot of people just used to throw it on their home policy. Um, and we've kind of gone away from that where a lot of people now just have their own boat policy now. And I and personally, I, I like that better. I've never liked putting things under the home like that, personally. Maybe other than like jewelry and like artwork. I don't like putting boats and like businesses under the home policy because the coverage just isn't the same as if you just got your own policy separate from the home. So I've never been right. I've never been the broker that's done that way. I know other people that have, but personally, I don't like doing that because I just find the coverages aren't the greatest when you attach it to the home because it's a whole and, policy for a reason. Well, and there's another aspect that I remember learning uh, multiple years ago, and this is for trailers and boats. But if you add uh, maybe like a trailer or a boat floater or a vacation trailer or whatever it is onto the home policy. It's an extension of that policy, which means that if you have, let's say, a claim, it's still an insurance claim on your home insurance because it's been on that policy. So if you're trying to go elsewhere, that could hinder things. If you have that separate boat insurance policy, just like a car, just like something else, it's attached to that specific type of risk. So having a separate boat policy is now beneficial because not only... Is there a separate liability aspect from the legal side, which I know we're going to chat about, but it also 
kind of separates the the claim scenario onto its own uh, proper boat policy with boat coverages. It's not just an extension of the home. So there's a couple of really, really unique features to boat insurance. And over the years too, a lot of companies that have kind of honed in or specialized on boat insurance have done a way better job of providing policies that are more encompassing. They offer more frills. They offer competitive pricing. Um, and they're also doing things that the typical home providers really didn't want to do in the past. Yeah, it's just more tailored product to what the actual insurance should be covering. It's like, we're not going to put a car under a home policy. We just, we, we, we don't do that, right? So it's nice to see that a more tailored product has come out. Um, and again, it's always been out there, but I just know that a lot of like back in like the eighties and nineties, a lot of people would just throw it on their home policy, especially if it was a small boat. If it was a small, like aluminum boat, a thousand bucks, it was just, I would see like all the time, like I and talk to people, Oh, it was always under just my home because it was, again, it was a small little boat. Now, if we're talking a big, like 25, 30 foot boat, okay, well, that's a little bit different, but I always found that those like small little fishing boats, a lot of people would just either, unfortunately not insure them. Or they would just throw them under their home policy because, again, it was just super cost effective to do it that way. But again, the actual coverages and breakdown of the policy were a lot less effective than it was if you just put it on its own boat policy separately. Yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah, and there's there's lots of different boat companies out there that are really really competitive. So it makes uh, it makes total sense to do it on its own. And in most cases, again, I would recommend that as well. Moving away from the insurance side of things, um, we just kind of wanted to go over some general like safety and just kind of some stats and stuff. Just because, again, um, it is the summertime. People are out enjoying themselves. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more people on the water. Um, and we just wanted to make sure that people obviously are following the guidelines and rules. And the, honestly, the biggest one that I wanted to bring up, and Mike was actually kind of shocked when I said this, but... Just like a car, you need a boating license to drive a boat. So in Ontario, there's like a boating course that you can do. It's about 50 bucks to do. Um, I know there's been rumors out there that this course is going to change and that they might make it. So how it is currently now is that you do the you do the course, it's 50 bucks, you do you go through the exam and whatnot, and you get your license. Your license is basically effective forever. But there's been rumblings that the government now wants to change it where it's basically like your license and it has to be renewed every five years. So what we might see down the pipeline is that it might turn into a renewal license, just like kind of how your driver's license is. But the main point I did want to bring up is that, please, if you're going to drive a boat, please have a boating license because you'd be surprised of how many people I talk to that don't have a boating license and they still boat around. And I'm, and it just, it, it it shocks me that people would take that risk, especially when a boating license, as of right now, is a lifetime license that you have, and it costs you fifty dollars. Right? Yeah. That that I was super surprised when you told me that. I thought it was not only common sense, but just um, the norm. Um, I mean, I don't even know how you would buy a boat and and either not be told you needed one to drive, or family or friends somebody would not indicate. Like I don't even know how that knowledge isn't. Uh, maybe widely known, but, but Hey, that's not for me to judge. I think what it really breaks down to is that a lot of other recreational vehicles, like ATVs, snowmobiles, that kind of stuff. Like technically, if you're on your own property, you don't have to have a license to drive. Now, if you're on public roads, that's a separate story because they have to be insured, registered, licensed. You have to be licensed, all that kind of jazz. But if you're technically using it on your own private property, they don't have to be insured. They don't have to be licensed. They don't have to be registered. You technically don't have to have a license to even ride these things. So I think what a lot of people think is that they fill it, they they go into this bracket of it's a recreational vehicle and I technically don't need a license for it. Well, you don't own – unless you own a whole river or lake or whatever it might be, which no one does – um, you can't really do that. So it's super, super important. If you are going to be operating a boat, please operate it with a license. Like I said, it literally is a $50 course with an exam that you pass. That is a lifetime license. Is that going to change in the future? We don't know yet, 
But even if it is, every five years, just like your driver's license, you have to renew it. Just do the exam and get it over with. And again, you'll never have to worry about it. But it's so, so important to make sure that if you are going to operate a boat, please have a license to operate a boat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's common sense, but also... um... Yeah, I mean, especially when you're when you're up north, more in vacation areas. Uh, I know, I know, OPP are all over the waterways up there. Well, yeah, they want to make sure that people are obviously following the rules, um, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. But and they want to make sure people are safe, right? Like, um, I guess we'll kind of get into the stats here. But Mike, I pulled up here about 525 canes die every year um, due to water related fatalities. So, like, I, it might not seem a lot, but it's still o- almost half of, like, it's it's getting to the point where it's like, okay, you have about 525 people that are dying every year just because of water-related, like, accidents. Like, well, and what to me that, what that really says is, um, you know, it's not like it's five a year where across Canada where you can look at that as being flukes. Like, 500 a year is enough where we can say it happens, right? It's significant enough where it happens, um, f- obviously frequently enough too, where sure, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen to you, but it very well could because those numbers kind of speak volumes, right? It's, it's not like, again, it's not five, it's 500. So, I mean, insurance is there for the worst case scenarios too, to help provide some legal action and help if you do require it. But those stats, that's what that kind of tells me, James, is that these these things do happen. Accidents do happen, which is one of the biggest reasons that we do have insurance on so many different products in our life. And um, yeah, I mean, the numbers are going to keep rising, I think, because boater safety and stuff is so important. But we also have more and more people, like you said, that don't have licenses even. So maybe there's more people out there that, that might get involved in stuff, unfortunately. Here's another stat, too, that I kind of like, which kind of gets into our next topic here, is that less than 50% of Canadians who own a boat always, that's the key word, always wear their life jackets, even though 82% of them believe it's a legal requirement. So getting into that conversation, life jackets are a must on a boat. And I know that might sound like common sense, but you need to have a life jacket. And not only do you need to have a life jacket, you need to have a life jacket that will properly um operate Let's, yeah because it's, every life jacket isn't used for every single person there's obviously like weight requirements and height and all that kind of stuff so you want to make sure that again if you're like a younger kid you can't use the same life jacket when you're five compared to when you're 10 you need to make sure that those like kids are obviously increasing in size the life jacket can like obviously withstand weight and, and, and height and all that kind of stuff um but you just need to make sure that they they actually work because I see so many people that have the same life jacket for like 10, 15 years and they go and try to put it on and it's like, it doesn't even fit them or the, I know. the, the weight requirement is like literally like half of what they weigh or like half of how their height is. And it's like, no, you should be always making sure that even if you want to hand it down to the next person, great. If they can wear it, awesome. But don't just wear the same life jacket every single year. If you know that it probably is not going to work if you actually need to use it. Yeah, Totally. Totally. And the big thing is having the right, the proper number as well for the number of people on the boat, right? So I know with a lot of like pontoon boats and stuff like that, that I've been a part of, you know, if you can fit those um, like eight people comfortably, you know, you have to have eight stowed in the seats somewhere, right? And um, I would, I would, I mean, I, I wonder if the, the numbers are interesting enough, but how many of those water related fatalities are as a result of um, maybe just improper right? Life jackets, for example, on board, and then people don't know how to swim. And then it turns into a a tragic event. I'll be the first person to sit here and say when I was, when we were younger and we had the fishing boats, I was guilty of it. We had life jackets on board. We didn't wear them all the time. They were just, they were there. Like if we needed them, but again, like when you're, when you're on these bigger boats, like n- name one person that wears their life jacket the whole time. Like when you're out on the water, like how many times you've been on a pontoon boat and every single person's wearing a life jacket. It's just, ne- it never happens, but you want to make sure if you have 10 people, you want to have 10 life jackets. It's, it's just, it's common sense. You need to have just like seatbelts, the same amount of seatbelts for the same amount of riders, the same amount of 
uh, life jackets for the same amount of boaters. It's the same concept. So if you're going to go out with five boaters, please have five life jackets. It's not that it's like I said, the same amount of drivers and boaters, just like a car, you want to have the same amount of life jackets as a boaters on a boat. Yeah. Yep. That's a, yeah, it's a big safety thing. Um, again, not a huge surprise might seem like common sense, but alcohol is, pre- is present or suspected in more than 50% of boating fatalities. Unfortunately, we always have to bring this topic up just like cars and uh, car accidents, unfortunately, alcohol and drugs now uh, are becoming more and more of an issue, especially out on the water. And again, I know people want to have fun. People always indulge in drinks. Um, I would always say if you're the driver of the boat, maybe don't indulge in the drinks. If the, if the driver or if the riders want to, no problem. But technically, if, if you want to get from a technical standpoint, if a boat doesn't have a, a washroom on board, there shouldn't even be alcohol on board. So, but again, these stats are really not alarming to me. Again, if it happens in cars, it's probably going to happen on boats. But again, it just, it is pretty alarming that basically over half of fatalities are basically saying that there is alcohol involved. Um, the, I you know the one thing too with, um, especially with, you know, with booze and everything else is that it's, it's the same thing for underwriting as um, cars as well. I know a lot of the, the boat companies nowadays, James, they have questions right on the application, right? For um, basically the same type of things, right? Tickets, claims, things like that in vehicles. So if you have a, let's say, less than, than desirable driving record with your Ontario driver's license, your car license, um, getting a boat policy can actually be tough for that exact same reason because it's it's looking at your driving habits the same way i know that and i know it's been a thing with a at least a half dozen providers here that i've seen over the years is that it's you the underwriting is cracking down on that just because just because you're driving a a car in improper way doesn't mean getting that boat policy or driving a boat's going to be um you know it's it's still a you know a luxury sort of thing right it's not that necessity sort of thing you shouldn't you're not just given the right you still have to qualify for it yeah, and it's not like they like for auto insurance. They obviously pull your reports and stuff and whatnot. On boats, they really don't do that. But again, if if there's a correlation between you having tickets on a, in a car, you're probably going to be doing the same silly stuff in a boat, if not worse. Because again, it's not as people think the waterways aren't as monitored as roads are. But I would almost say they are even almost more monitored because again, they don't want people out on the boat on boats and other. Um, watercraft doing silly stuff and obviously putting the lives of other people at risk too, right? It's just, it's just, and again, we talked about this before the podcast, but unfortunately, at the worst case scenario, if you get into a car accident and you're unconscious and can't move, that's a little bit different because you're you're on land, you're not in water. Well, if you're unconscious and fall overboard and you're in the water, you're probably gonna drown because you can't swim. And your body's just taking on water and it can't really do anything because your body's not like is, is basically unconscious. Right. So it, it's a little bit different when you're in a car accident compared to when you're in a boating accident, especially you get knocked overboard, you hit your head on the boat, you hit your head on rocks or whatever it might be. Like how many times have we heard that the people are, are doing that kind of stuff and they, they just accidentally hit their head and then they can't, they, they just sink. Right. And then they can never can find them again. Right. Yeah. That, that Those are super tragic things. And that's, again, one of the reasons you have um, insurance. I mean, boater safety is number one, but um, if you're involved in something, you know, with especially a third party, similar to that of a car, you have that third party liability, which is there to protect, hopefully, the, the legal side of what a, a claim looks like moving forward. So, we, I mean, you hope that ever happens. But again, another reason why you have that insurance. Moving on to some more safety um, safety tips here. Again, it is a legal requirement for you to have a, um, I like to call it your safety bucket. So in this bucket is obviously a, the bucket actually is the bail bucket. So if you're taking on water, you can obviously get that water out of the boat. But inside, there's also other things too. So like I personally, when I'm boating, I put my license in that bucket. Just because, again, 
I don't want to keep it on me and it just to get it lost and stuff. So it usually just goes in that bucket. But in that bucket too, there could be things like um, flashlights. There could be whistles, um, all these things that kind of help you in, in case of, again, your boat being um, submerged in water for some reason. <laughs> Funny story is I always say to every boater now, before you go on the on your boat, please make sure that you check your um, the release plug like at the back of the boat. <laughs> because when I was younger, it didn't happen to me. It only happened to me once, but we had these small boats and they weren't on trailers because we had a cottage. So we could just drag the boat from like basically like our boat launch down or like where we stored our boats down to the boat launch. So me and my buddies were going to go take the boats out and uh, go fishing. But I guess during us dragging the boat down from where we stored the boats down to the boat launch, I guess the plug in the back got dislodged and fell onto the grass. Well, I didn't see that because they're always just, uh, we always put them in and then like, the, like we've never had an issue with that. So I remember I put the motor on cause it was an outboard motor. It was just like a little, like 10 horsepower. We were like young kids. We were like 10, maybe 12. And, um, I remember I put the motor on, put the gas tank in and we were going to go get our fishing rods and stuff. And I come back and the boat is literally like, and luckily it was just like little shallow water there, but like the boat was literally just sitting like with the with the uh, the front just out of the water and the the motor was like just in like submerged in water because the plug had fallen out, so oh. it was just like oh man. But like I always just say to people, make sure you're always checking the plug because that actually is a like people would be shocked of how many times that that is like the big reason that people take on water that it might not be snug enough, so you take on a little bit of water, but over time it could just obviously like keep filling up but or like or in general like the plug might just fall out and you're taking on more water than you should be and you're like oh what like what's going on do we have a leak but a lot of the time it's because either the plug might not be snug enough the plug might just again the plug did, decays over time it's just a little piece of rubber basically right so you want to always inspect that as well because again i know that happened to me and i know a lot of other people that it's happened to them so making sure that you're not only inspecting that part of the boat, but just inspect your boat all the time. You want to make sure that your boat doesn't randomly have gashes in it. Again, you're in the water, especially for little small, like aluminum boats. Like your people are taking them through little shallow waters um, to fish and stuff. You want to make sure that it's not rubbing against like any logs um, or like rocks or something when you're fishing. So just always doing an inspection on your boat to make sure that it is like obviously water worthy before you're putting it in and possibly having it sink when you're actually on it. And then, and then, and then, have to put through a claim at that point too for the value of it. <laughs> yeah, well, that wasn't really claimable for us. It was just kind of like, uh, let's now let's pick it up out of the water and basically like get it, get the water out of it, and then get it back on the water again. Because right away we found we were like, oh, I didn't put the we didn't, the 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 uh, the plug must have fallen out, right? So yeah, right, right. That's uh, yeah, that that's the worst. But like I said, it's always important to make sure that you are inspecting that kind of stuff because again, for us, like it was such a common thing for us to make sure it was there. But like I said, just from us dragging it from maybe 200 meters, if that, if it fell out, right? So either we must have not put it in properly or it just nicked the piece of grass and it just fell out, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Something like that, something like that unfortunately happens. Yes, it does. And like I said, that's why it's always important to check. Um, and I'll actually, you know what? Another big thing is um, paddles. <laughs> Another funny story is I remember I, it was even, I was probably even younger and we, all I was allowed to ride was like, you know, those like little like trolling the electric motors. Yeah. That's all we basically had. Um, one second. Sorry. Um, no, it's, it's all good. I, we were younger and we had like the electric trolling motors and I remember it died on us for some reason. I don't know. I, and we literally had charged it like all the time and it just died. 
so like we're and it was a really like the current was really weird like where we were because we had cottages basically like on the grand river and the current usually wasn't super fast but for today for that day it was super fast so basically what happened was we were like in the middle of the like the river basically but like we were basically just drifting from side to side because there was nothing we could do right but it's super super important to make sure you have oars so that in the case of your motor actually like dying you can get to one side or get back to shore and make sure because actually it was probably another 10 kilometers downstream but there is actually a dam with a waterfall that goes over right so we weren't super right. close right but, you, but oars are actually a, a um a part that you need to have on the boat just in case if your motor goes yeah, you know, that that, that brings up a, a super good point just with respect to like kind of knowing where you're going as well, especially being in Niagara, right? Because there is um, I, there's certain rivers and stuff like that too, like especially above the falls where you kind of got to know where where you're putting your boat in, right? You don't want to be getting to a spot where you get into like a, a rapids area or anything like that. Yeah, you want to make sure you're like aware of what's around the area, right? And usually when there's like rapids or if there's a waterfall or something like that, they're going to have buoys that basically say that like in the water. So it's not like it just randomly like comes up and surprises you. Like it's it's usually marked in the water if those kind of things are coming up. But um, another big point too is um, I know I kind of talked about flashlights, but if you are going to be boating in the dark, you want to make sure that you have lights on either side of your boat usually they're green and yellow or green and red and then usually have a spotlight as well um but you if you are going to be boating at night you need to have these um lights on your boat and i like i said they are green and red in color to make sure that you are um locatable at night time what um i don't think i I don't think i had anything else myself for tips and tips and tricks to be honest no, I would basically just say for my kind of like to kind of wrap things up. I think my final takeaway from this before I let you kind of do your takeaway is just be just be use your common sense for you on the boat, right? It's just like a car. You're not going to be drinking and driving. You're not going to be speeding. You're not going to be doing all those silly things. So like I said, just like a car, use your common sense when you're out on the boat. Don't do things you shouldn't be doing. Um if you're going to be drinking, maybe don't be operating the boat. If you're going to be with a lot of people, don't be putting the risk of people. You've seen all these videos too, like online of people like on boats and like, again, like how the water is too. Like I always go back to that one video that's always on Americans funniest home videos where like they're like the family's like boating and you can tell the water's choppy because the boat is hitting the water like in like crazy, like up and down, up and down, up and down. But the guy's still like putting in the boat full throttle and then all of a sudden he hits a wave and they all like fly out of the boat and yeah it's funny but at the same time it's like well no like it's dangerous to be doing that so always make sure like i said use your common sense be safe but also like realizing what the conditions of the water are going to be if it's a windy and choppy day don't be going full throttle through the water because your boat is needs to glide through that water properly not smacking the water over and over and over again and possibly like i said capsizing because the water, the waves are so high, so right. I would just again use common sense, be safe, don't do something you would wouldn't do in your car. The same rules apply: drinking, smoking, any of that kind of stuff. You could potentially get a DUI if caught doing it. So just just don't do it. Just be safe. The big thing that I'll take away because I as I was thinking with this episode while we were doing it too um, was to kind of go back to the, I guess just overall necessity to have a boat insurance policy right um there's there's probably a lot of people out there too that unfortunately have boats and say ah, it's not worth anything to me it's not necessarily valuable i don't need insurance and the thing that i always refer back to is that of car insurance as well where the it's not necessarily about the vehicle value but the reason you have that insurance is from the legal lawsuit side so the liability coverage alone is very, very important, right? Um, the same reason why, like, you know, some people don't care about their contents as a renter or an old vehicle. You still need insurance for that liability protection. It's the biggest, most expensive part of a policy because it's the biggest risk to the insurance company. 
but it still means that you have that same risk out in the water, whether it's property damage or personal injury. Unfortunately, accidents, as we've discussed, can and will happen. Um, and you don't want to be on the wrong side of that with absolutely no no policy to cover it and be held personally liable and accountable for that if it uh, if it goes to court. So Exactly. Yeah, uh, basically get a policy in place. As we mentioned, there are lots of companies out there right now doing um, individual boat policies that are separate from your home insurance. They're very competitive. It takes five, 10 minutes to get an idea on pricing. And more importantly, it's... Uh, yeah, it's protecting that uh, that liability side that not everyone always thinks of. So, yeah, that would be my biggest my biggest takeaway this time because everyone should have a policy for it if they're riding it. Even a jet ski it doesn't matter the type of watercraft. We insure almost almost everything from what I can tell or look into in the past, anyways. So uh, it's always just give us a call and, and see if we can assist. Exactly, it's always a. It's always worth the, the the conversation to make sure that things are covered properly. And again, it's like we say every episode, never no questions silly enough to just ask us and be like, hey, how is this how should I ensure this? And we'll guide you through that that um that process. So And I find too with boat insurance, it's well, you know, it's not, it's not really that valuable. But as we kind of mentioned at the beginning, that agreed upon value is something that we can discuss together based on your thoughts, right? So if it is an older boat and it's only worth a couple of grand, you're probably looking at no more than maybe, you know, two or $300 for the whole year. Um, it's not that much money and it does still provide a lot of protection to you as the owner of it or to others that are operating your boat, right? Friends, family come up and they want to drive it. Another reason why it's so important to have that insurance in place is for those kind of unknown factors and unknown risks that uh, that uh, could happen when when either lending your boat to family or friends or or just you know operating that yourself. Exactly. But again, we appreciate you guys tuning in this week. Um, like I said, every week it comes out on the Tuesday prior. Unfortunately, this week I completely thought I issued the episode so it's actually gonna be coming out last week's episode is gonna come out today actually at noon instead of yesterday um so i apologize for that it just i i literally thought i clicked the um submit button i guess i just didn't so it was literally sitting in my drafts so it's up today you'll see that one from next from last week when we kind of talked about um renewals and kind of going over some of the processes behind that um but again always make sure you follow and subscribe just so you never miss an episode. So you're notified when we actually post an episode on all our streaming sites and YouTube and everything, but we will check you guys next week on the broker breakdown.